first of all, a little bit of background. What is the preload node? What is a preload node, right? So the preload node is, uh, is a node, a Go IPFS node that we set up to help out JS IPFS. So JS IPFS, uh, if you're running in a browser, you cannot establish a direct TCP connection. If you roll, if you reload the page, you lose all of your application state. You have a very limited amount of local storage. I mean, so what we did, what, what we have is we have some uh, some nodes that, on the one hand, they will actually be work as a D, as a DHT proxy. So you want you are in JS IPFS, you want to load to load something from the IPFS network. Well, you cannot connect to the DHT because uh, you cannot do TCP connections. So uh, it acts as a proxy for JS IPFS, and it also serves as a place to persist the. Uh, the storage of the JS IPFS node, so that if you reload the page, your content is still there. So what is a problem with the preload nodes? Well, it turns out that the preload nodes also need to act as bootstrap nodes. We'll get into why in a moment. And the bootstrap node addresses are hard-coded in JS IPFS, in the library itself. You can override it if you're running a node app or if you're writing an application on top of it, but people usually don't do that. And since the peer IDs are hard-coded, you cannot just, you know, add more pre more bootstrap or preload nodes because they will not connect to them, and you cannot change them because the you cannot change to a different node because, of course, the peer ID is uh, is hard coded, right? And we to start with, uh, PL had two pre two preload nodes, node zero and node one. Node two and node three were added later, but the problem is that older versions of the library only know of node zero and node one, and people are not upgrading because upgrading is a pain. Basically, no, not enough care uh, has been taken to ensure compatibility between versions, API compatibility between versions. I think things are getting better, but older versions, so upgrading from an older version to a newer version can be a hassle, so people don't do it, which means that node zero and node one are basically getting hammered. And I discovered this during my first, the first thing I did when I joined Protocol Labs, which uh, I had to scale up the preload node, node zero and node one. And even after the scaling, because they were crashing, uh, I don't know, uh, every half hour to one hour, basically the uh, uh, Go IPFS was running out of memory. So we scaled them up and now they're crashing only twice a day, more or less. So it's better, but it's of course not ideal. So how do we solve this? Well, we basically do a man in the middle attack. So we create something kind of a reverse proxy. I mean, that's the way you scale things in, um, that's the way you scale things in web two. Well, let's gra get, uh, grab a page from the play two, one of the web two playbook, and let's create some sort of reverse proxy and load balancer, which would impersonate the node. It would basically take over its peer ID it's private key it's private and public keys and uh it basically uh uses a bunch of go ipfs nodes in the background to uh, down uh, downstream to actually uh get the data right i call it kitsune which in chinese mythology is the magical many-tailed fox so it's one head which is uh where the upstream nodes the js ipfs nodes can connect to and many tails where are the other go ipfs nodes so I had to figure out what does the how the, how JS IPFS talks to the preload node, right? So it basically, yeah, I mean, it connects via via WebSocket through to BitSwap via the WebSocket transport, right? So it it uses BitSwap, but it also uses the the API port and it calls this endpoint called API v0 refs. What that does is it forces the, the what the API does is it forces the, the Go IPFS node to go on the DHT, get the get the no, get, get the block, get that SID, and you can actually tell it to get it recursively. So it will actually get all of the nodes that this node references through IPLD. Okay, so it has the, basically it has two connections. It has the HTTP port and it has the web service port. So I dove into how this works, right? So uh, on the one hand, for proxying the DHT, the application will call IPFS get, for example, and JS IPFS will make a post and request the refs recursively. It does a, it does a recursive get. Then that the preload node will fetch the content, and then JS IPFS will send a want over the bit swap channel, and then the Go IPFS node, well, the preload node will send the blocks back. 
right? So I had to dive into how BitSwap works. Uh, for persistence, it does the other it does it the other way around. So the app, the application calls IPFS add, which adds it to the node's local storage. Then it sends another IPFS refs with that CID, and what that does is the preload node will qu query its peers for that CID, and of course the only peer that has it is the the JS IPFS node. So that JS IPFS node will return will respond to that want with the box. So we have on the one hand we have a want coming from the uh, from the from upstream and going to all the to the downstream peers and then we have we, we can also have the want coming from the upstream peer going to the downstream peer. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we have wants wants and blocks going both ways, right? So we have a couple of challenges here. First of all, I did not know Go, so I took this as a chance to learn Go, and then of course diving into how to uh, how to use the P2P and how BitSwap works. There was a couple of challenges. So uh, one problem is that BitSwap actually, when you send a want, it will not send the blocks over the same stream that it got the want on. It will open a new stream. So I get this stream from this uh, from that upstream node. Okay, uh, who requested this? Excuse me, because I do not have the association. So I had to make it to to keep track of who wanted what, so I could send them what they wanted. Uh, the other part is that when you do a request to API D0 refs, you do not have the peer ID. So you do not know who requested that ref, so you do not know who to set, who to set the blocks to again. Sorry, who to set the wants to. So the, the downstream node sends a want and says, okay, who requested this? So right now what I just what I did was, okay, just send it to all of them, kind of like GoIPFS does, but there is an optimization that can be done later. Uh, by the using the Pierce IP address. There was one unforeseen consequence or effect of this. So on the one hand, Kitsune does not participate in the DHT. Basically, it's only doing bit swap and of course the identify and ping protocols, the basic the P2P protocols, and it's doing bit, bit swap. Which is interesting is that I'm getting the when I get a don't have message from the downstream peer, meaning, yes, I do not have that. I do not have, I do just send me a want and I don't have it. So Kitsune will call API v0 refs and actually have the, have that, that the Go IPFS node query the whole DHTU, which is basically what uh, also needed for JS IPFS. But the effect of this is that this can be used as a generic one to one to uh, one way P to P to P to P to P beer uh, bridge. I might have done a one to extra to P. P to P to P to P bridge. Uh, meaning that, for example, you're in a private network, right? You have a you have a private swarm, a private network, but you want to get some content from the public network. That happens, for example, when you upgrade Go IPFS, and Go IPFS needs to. Uh, upgrade the repository, and it does it does a query to get the repository upgraded by of the binary. And I had that we had that problem in our pre, in my previous job. So now you can actually peer everyone with your with your Kitsune instance, and that will actually get the information from the public swarm without exposing the information from your private swarm. You can also even if you have your private swarm, then you can also do a post to API v0 refs on Kitsune. It will get it from the from the upstream nodes, from your internal nodes, and expose it to the world. And it also, I mean, uh, yes, we're all peer to peer. Yes, we're all supposed to be co to ne to connect to each other. But network administrators beg to differ. They some network administrators really want to control what traffic is coming in and out of their networks. So Kitsune will allow allow them to have computers that will host that participate in in IPFS, but without having to allow everyone to connect to everyone to everyone on the internet. That's just some of the ideas I got from possible consequences from uh, from what we're doing here. So next slide, please. So what's our current status? Well, we do have a GitHub repo. Uh, and I have actually, it has actually been able to transfer content both between two Go IPFS and between two JS IPFS nodes. We actually have a, a test a, a test that will check that the preload node works. And that's what I've been using to test this. And a few next steps, well, the, the want optimization I mentioned earlier about just sending the want depending on the IP address that the refs call came from. Uh, for production use we, use, we will need to add metrics. 
Uh, I would really like to add configuration because right now it's just configured via command line flags. And again, for production use, it's more, more convenient to have a file or environment variables. Uh, yes, tests. We need to add some tests. Also, load testing. I have no idea how this will behave under load. Uh, some cleanup of the code. And right now, the private swarm thing is not yet a thing because we do not have private swarm support. A big thanks to Lido, to Max, to Adin, to Horopo. They, all, they were all extremely helpful in developing this. And thanks for to everyone in the cohort because it was a blast. It was an awesome time working with you guys. Uh, first of all, for WebSockets, you actually need to have an SSL certificate. So I was thinking of getting my own SSL certificate, and then I discovered NGROC. Uh, so NGROC, what it does is it creates a proxy, an SSL proxy. And my proxy is right now, this host here, FB92, blah, 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 is being proxied to port 28080. Now, here is where Kitsune is running. And I'm telling him, telling, telling it there is one downstream node, which is uh, my, lo my Go IPFS node on my local machine. I am telling it to listen on, to listen for bit swap on 24001. And I'm telling it to listen on WebSocket on 28080. And minus P is because I put the preload functionality behind the switch. So if people want to actually use it as a proxy, they don't have to enable pre the, the proxy functionality. So it's soon starting. And now I will just run the, uh, J the preload tester. Just need to change so that the bootstrap no address is F9B. Two, which is basically the same address that we have down here. And so I'm connecting, as you see here, I'm connecting through WSS to this node. And this ID is the same ID that I have in Kitsune. So nothing in my sleeve. And basically this, what, it, what this does is it starts uh, using Puppeteer. It starts a browser, a node inside the browser. And it starts another node in Node.js. And then it adds some content in the browser. And then it tries to get it from Node.js. From, uh, Node and hopefully it will work. Because, of course, you know the demo gods are the demo gods. It is a bit slow just because of timing. And yeah, the preloader is working as expected. It basically published uh, this content, test content created, blah, 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 blah. And it says, yeah, it's working. I mean, if anyone wants to see a little bit more about how it works, then just uh, ping me at any time. <laughs>